Hi, my name is Dave, and I am a collection of highly regulated and coordinated chemical reactions occurring at the rates and the necessary locations to be compatible with life. Woo! It feels good to get that off my chest. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. As you can probably guess from the title of this video, today we're going to be talking about chemistry. Now you may be thinking, hey, why is this biology teacher teaching me about chemistry? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Just like everything else in the universe, biological organisms consist entirely of chemicals. So before we can understand how a biological organism actually functions, how it behaves, we first must understand how the biological molecules within those organisms function to make life possible. But before we can get to that point, we need to understand several key chemical principles, and that's what we're here to discuss today. Now, it may not have shocked you that all living things are made out of chemicals. Everything else in the universe is, so why wouldn't organisms consist of chemicals? But what may shock you is if you take any organism, the smallest bacterium to the most complex human to the biggest tree in the forest, and broke them down just into atoms, and then arranged those atoms according to which element they belong, you would discover that about 97% of those atoms belong to just six different elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, or CHOMPs for short. Now, we do not, and neither does any biological organism, consist of those atoms in their elemental forms. Instead, we consist of arrangements of atoms that are called compounds. Compounds are formed when two or more atoms combine with each other and interact to form a new type of chemical. But before we can understand that, before we can understand that, before we can understand the chemical reactions that lead to those compounds forming, first we need to understand what atomic structure looks like. So what you can see here is what we call the planetary model of an atom. In the center of an atom, you've got the nucleus with its positively charged protons and its non-charged neutrons. And then orbiting that positively charged nu nucleus, you have negatively charged electrons. Now, in actuality, they don't orbit the nucleus in these tidy little rings just like the planets orbit the sun. No. Instead, they actually exist in this weird nebulous cloud surrounding the nucleus. And if you get into quantum mechanics, you learn that you can't actually tell exactly where an electron is. And it's kind of crazy, but we're not going to cover that in this class. But what's important is this. Atoms all have unique properties. In fact, they're the smallest component in the universe that retains a unique property, and that's what gives elements their unique properties. And one of those unique properties is something called electronegativity. All atoms have some type of electronegativity. Electronegativity can best be defined as an atom's inherent desire to gain more electrons. Now you have some atoms like fluorine or chlorine that really, really want more electrons. Those are what we call highly electronegative atoms. And then you have others that don't want new electrons at all. In fact, they want to give away their electrons. They have very low electronegativity. These are things like sodium and lithium. And then in other places, particularly in the middle of the periodic table, you will see that there are atoms that kind of have moderate electronegativity. Sometimes they're taking electrons away, sometimes they're giving electrons away, but more often than not, they're just sharing. Things like carbon. So when we talk about atoms combining with each other, this whole interaction, anytime you have an interaction between two different atoms, at least in our biological context, what we are talking about is the electrons from two different atoms or two or more different atoms coming together to form a compound. So what I want to talk about now are the three major types of chemical bonds that, that are relevant in biological chemistry. We're going to go in order of what we call bond strength. We'll start with the strongest bonds and then move down to the weaker ones. In fact, we'll find out that the last one isn't technically a bond. It's called an intramolecular force. That's what your chemistry professor, your chemistry teacher would likely call it. In biology, we call them a bond. It's just nomenclature. Don't worry about it. So the first thing we'll talk about is what we call a covalent bond. 
A covalent bond occurs when two atoms or two or more atoms share electrons. So the first type of covalent bond we'll talk about is called a nonpolar covalent bond. A great example of this is carbon dioxide. If you look at carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is one of those elements that's towards the middle of the periodic table. It has very intermediate electronegativity. It neither wants electrons very badly, nor does it wish to give them away. Oxygen is pretty much right next to it on the periodic table. It has slightly more electronegativity, but not that bad. When you combine carbon and two oxygen atoms to make carbon dioxide, what they will do is they will share their outer shell or valence electrons fairly evenly. The result of this is a molecule that is pretty much straight in structure. The electrons are equally spaced out around all of the atoms. And as a result, this particular molecule has no charge whatsoever. It's what we would call a nonpolar covalent molecule. Now, covalent bonds are the strongest form of bonds, and they're what happens when, again, atoms share their electrons. But sometimes, sometimes atoms don't like to share their electrons evenly. And this is what's called a polar covalent bond. I've got two kids. I've got an almost nine-year-old son and an almost six-year-old daughter. And they're really good at playing together most of the time. But one of the things I've noticed is that when they're doing something together, when they're sharing a toy, they don't really share equally. My son, who's a little bit older, tends to share like 70% of the time, whereas my younger daughter seems to get like 30% of the shared device. Are they sharing? Yes. Is it even? No. So that's kind of what happens here. And all of this inherent desire for electrons comes into play here. If you have two atoms that have a fairly pronounced difference in terms of their electronegativity, for example, let's take oxygen, which is over here on the right side of the periodic table, and hydrogen, which is way over here on the left. The electronegativity difference between oxygen and hydrogen is pretty different. It's not super different, but it's different enough where it matters. So that if you take an oxygen atom and combine it with two hydrogen atoms, the result is that the oxygen atoms are going to share those shared electrons a little more. They're going to have a little more time with those electrons. They're going to hold them a little bit tighter to their nucleus than the two smaller hydrogen atoms will. Now, are they still sharing electrons? Sure, absolutely. They're playing together for sure. But are they doing so equally? No. And here's the result of that. Remember, electrons have a charge. They have a negative charge. So if the oxygen atom is spending a little more time with the electrons, it's going to have a weak negative charge. On the other hand, those hydrogen atoms that are spending less time with those shared electrons are going to have a slightly positive charge. Now, it's not a complete charge. We're not talking about an ion, for example. We'll talk about those in a minute. But it's enough that the molecule itself has a bent shape to it because of that unequal sharing. And the oxygen side of that bent molecule is slightly negative. And the hydrogen side of that bent molecule is slightly positive. This is going to have important implications down the road, in particular in another lecture when we talk about the properties of water. Okay. Now, whenever we have covalent bonds occurring, polar or nonpolar, the end resulting compound is referred to as a molecule. And covalent bonds are the strongest of the three major bond types that we'll talk about today. So let's take a step down in the bond strength. Let's talk about ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are the next type of bond, and ionic bonds only occur when the atoms involved have vastly different electronegativities. A great example of this is what happens when you combine sodium and chlorine. Chlorine is way over on the right-hand side of the periodic table, way over in the highly electronegativity zone. Sodium is on the complete opposite side of the periodic table. In fact, it's kind of in the zone of like, I don't even really want my extra electrons. You can just have them. It's kind of sodium's feeling about what we call its valence or outer shell electron. It only has one. You'd rather just get rid of it. So when you combine a sodium atom and a chlorine atom under the right conditions, they will combine to form a compound. That compound is called sodium chloride. You know it better as table salt. But if you actually look at what's going on at the atomic level, 
rather than sharing those valence electrons, those outer shell electrons, chlorine literally just rips that electron away. It says, I'm just going to take this. And sodium is like, fine, that's great. And that compound, rather than sharing electrons, consists of positively charged sodium cations and negatively charged chloride anions. And they just stack neatly together into something that we call a crystal lattice. This is the way covalent or ionic bonds exist. Ionic bonds always result in the formation of something called a salt. Now, way down at the bottom, if you've got covalent bonds here and ionic bonds here, way down at the bottom, you have this other type of bond called a hydrogen bond. Despite the fact that hydrogen bonds are the weakest of the three bonds that we'll talk about. In fact, if I were a chemistry professor teaching you this, I'd probably say that hydrogen bonds aren't really bonds. They're intermolecular forces. Uh, but they're so important to biology that we do classify them, at least in our context, as a bond. But chemistry teachers are right. It's not technically a bond. And the reason why is hydrogen bonds exist between compounds, not between atoms. In fact, hydrogen bonds only form between compounds that are formed through polar covalent bonds. For example, let's look at water. Take two water molecules and put them next to each other. Well, not unlike we see with the uh, with, with the ions inside of a ionically bound compound, you can see that there's a way for these mo water molecules to sort of stack on each other. The positively charged hydrogen uh, dipoles will interact with the negatively charged oxygen dipole on another molecule. And they can stack and interact that way. See, what's really neat about hydrogen bonds and the reason why they're so important in bio biology is this. Hydrogen bonds are weak enough where they can be very easily separated, but they're strong enough to hold things together. They're sort of like scotch tape or Velcro. They're strong enough to do the job, but weak enough where you don't require a whole complex enzyme-driven chemical reaction most of the time to separate them. And this is the reason why hydrogen bonds are so important. Hydrogen bonds are important in almost every aspect of biological chemistry. They are what hold the two strands of DNA, DNA together in a DNA molecule. They are what most often gives proteins their shape and holds them together. These interactions are so, they are what give water all of its magical properties, which again, we'll talk about in another video. Without hydrogen bonds, life would never be possible. Now, sure, they're much weaker than ionic and covalent bonds. In fact, they don't even create compounds. They exist between compounds. But they are so important in biological chemistry that they warrant a good deal of conversation, just like we did today. So just to recap, today we talked about atoms and elements. We talked about how atoms can combine with each other to form compounds through the formation of chemical bonds. We talked about covalent bonds, polar and nonpolar. Uh, we talked about um, ionic bonds and hydrogen bonds and the importance of electronegativity and how these bonds are formed. In our next set of videos, we'll talk about how these biological molecules once formed allow biological systems to function as they do. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you guys next time.